Uh, this morning we're, gonna, we're in our Daniel series. Uh, this is the second series, but overall this will be the seventh of twelfth if we go through all twelve chapters in the book of Daniel, which at this point I certainly intend on doing. But um, this is the second part of the series, um, second series, part three of three. So um, this morning we are going to be looking at Daniel chapter seven, which a uh, sermon title I've uh, titled The Hope of an Everlasting Kingdom, and uh, you'll see why as we work our way uh, through this book this morning. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot in the book of Daniel. There's a lot that could be said, uh, much of which I will try to try to get in, but obviously a lot that I'm not, not going to have the time to say unless you guys want to stay here for several hours, but um, just a fascinating book, and it's a blessing, and it really does um, speak to uh, the, the context of the times that we're living in right now as well. Uh, and it's, a, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, it's just a, um, it's very impactful for the, the, our lives and the situations that, that we're dealing with in our, in our culture today. Um, so in the world, even beyond what we have come to expect and anticipate as general evil or wickedness, are natural disasters, and of course, uh, we've just seen recently there are hurricanes, there's tornadoes, there's floods, there's earthquakes, there's wildfires, and droughts, and heat waves, and so on. We could go on. Um, and there's a devastation that they cause in the world, but there are wars and conflicts that are already occurring in the world, uh, and it seems that even greater wars are brewing <clears throat> or are churning up in various nations. Uh, they're jockeying for power and position, and they're forming alliances together. So the unknowns and the uncertainties of the future can definitely seem ominous and scary and even terrifying, especially when you consider some of the advances of technology and the capabilities that can either be used for good or evil. And you're probably already thinking about some. There's, uh, there's AI and the, the, the internet and the, the computer world has opened up a whole, <laughs> a whole other can of worms. Um, there's AI, there's cyber spying and surveillance, there's hackers out there, there's identity thieves, uh, widespread social and cultural, cultural engineering and manipulation, surveillance, there's combat drones out there, uh, men don't even have to necessarily get involved in the fight sometimes, there's quantum computing, chemical biological weapons, nuclear weapons, uh, the threat of taking out the power grid, we could go on and on, couldn't we, with the different uh, things that might concern us. <clears throat> I certainly don't want to be all doom and gloom about it, but if we're being real, we can't deny uh, that things have moved rapidly and have gotten a little crazy, in the, especially in the past couple of decades, right? Things have moved really fast, it seems like, in the past couple of decades. Um, so if or when these types of concerns have begun to weigh on you and your hope for the future, or maybe your lack thereof, um, it's my hope and prayer today that the Lord's faithful would be encouraged that you'll be strengthened, that you'll be comforted by what we're going to read in Daniel 7 and beyond as we uh, work through the rest of the book. Um, all in knowing that the Lord already knows what's going to happen in the future uh, and, and knowing that he's in control. We mustn't cling to the things of this world or we're all going to get sucked in. We're going to, uh, be, we're going to have tunnel vision. We must always remember that when things, seem, uh, when things seem bad or when they get bad, whether it's personally or locally, or nationally, or internationally, <clears throat> I want you to immediately remind yourself that God is on the throne, and that you need to seek him in prayer, and that you need to glorify him regardless of the circumstances, knowing that he reigns always, past, present, future, and knowing that in the end, he wins. We know that already. Um, we're holding out as believers. We're holding out for a greater hope of eternity, something that this world is not able to offer us. Um, so questions to ponder as we work through this this morning. We could certainly come up with many more. Um, do the troubles, do the unknowns, the uncertainties of the future, do they cause you to worry, to fear, and to doubt? And I'm sure all of us can probably feel that a little bit, at least here or there. Do they weigh you down on a daily basis, causing you to focus uh, most of your time on, and attention on survival? Are we just trying to get by and survive in this life? And what is it that drives you forward, and where do you find your hope for the future? <clears throat> and I'm sure there's several other question, questions that kind of come out of uh, the things I already talked about. So today, and in the remaining chapters of the book of Daniel, uh, we're going to be looking at the prophecies that Daniel was given from the Lord uh, about future kings and kingdoms, even as far into the future as our current day, 
uh, and beyond, even unto eternity. These prophecies in Daniel 7, they um, not only include end times prophecies, but also messianic prophecies, uh, making them extremely important not only for God's holy people in antiquity, but also uh, for us as believers here today. Uh, and of course, we know that this story is still being told. This story hasn't ended yet. Anyone who has studied these types of prophecies, uh, they know that it's no secret that there's many differing interpretations regarding how these prophecies will manifest themselves uh, or have already manifested themselves throughout history. I'll not have the time to explain all the differing views. Uh, people have written several books and entire books about these <laughs> subjects, uh, but I may briefly offer some alternative views where, where it makes sense. I'll also preface this message by ensuring that everyone knows that the Nazarene denomination does not really take a dogmatic stance regarding the specific details of end times prophecy. They make allowance for each person to hold on to their personal conviction, uh, convictions regarding the end times and, and how they will uh, play out, their interpretations, their understandings. Uh, for the sake of, they do this for the sake of maintaining greater unity in the church. Uh, and they take no specific stance, stance on pre, post, or amillennial, uh, pre, mid, post, trib, or wrath. Uh, regarding the return of Christ and the rapture and so on. <clears throat> now, if you've heard of those words, and you've probably done some, some studying before, uh, and I may uh, unravel those the more uh, we work through this uh, series in the, in the future weeks, but not so much today. The Nazarene Church, uh, they, don't, they don't go there, so they do leave it to your interpretation. So as a disclaimer, uh, with all that being said, the interpretations that I'm going to put forth are not necessarily aligned with the Nazarene Church, maybe not against either, but not necessarily in alignment with the Nazarene church or denomination, uh, they should be viewed as either my personal int interpretations and understandings or those of various Bible scholars and end times expositors that I may or may not be in alignment with. So just a disclaimer there. Don't go, you know, rat me out to the, uh, uh, <laughs> to Dr. Bowser or whoever and say, man, that curly guy is off his rocker. He's talking all kinds of crazy stuff, um, which I don't plan to talk crazy stuff, but they might not align with your views. They might not uh, necessarily align with district views either, so uh, just a disclaimer. Um, as a Nazarene, there's the Articles of Faith, which if you are a member of the church, everyone should be at least mildly familiar with those, and uh, Article of Faith 15 and 16, I'll give you that as a homework, and you should read all of the Articles of Faith. Uh, you should know what you signed up for, so I encourage everyone to read the Articles of Faith, but 15 and 16 address more end times uh, thing, uh, types of things, so... Uh, Article of Faith 15 is the second coming of Christ, and 16 is resurrection, judgment, and destiny. So uh, you do have some there to, to look at from the denominational perspective. <clears throat> some general guidelines for uh, understanding and interpreting Bible prophecy. I think they're important to have. And as, uh, <clears throat> as awesome and fascinating as Bible prophecy is, it can also be very intimidating and confusing to read, especially without first under understanding um, some things going into it. There's some guidelines, there's some things that can help you to maybe get a better understanding, to maybe know even some of the limitations that you might run into. So uh, one is that rather getting lost in every minute detail of a of prophetic uh, words or books in the Bible, to focus on the central themes of the book. What is, the author, what is God trying to tell um, <clears throat> the prophet or the people uh, by, by sharing the prophecy? Uh, what is the central theme? So uh, you don't want to miss the, the forest for the trees. You want to try and see what is the central message that, is try, that he's trying to get across. Um, a lot of times we do this with parables. You get so caught up in the details of the story and the people and trying to mine into the background of lives, but when Christ was mainly trying to make a key point or maybe a couple key points by using the parable. He wasn't trying to write a novel uh, to make the example. Um, <clears throat> contextual understanding. Um, it's important to look at what's going on in the world at the times that these prophecies are giving. What's going on in the lives of the prophets themselves and the kingdoms that they're living in? Uh, what's the relationship like uh, between Israel and the Lord and the, and the covenant at that time? Are they keeping the covenant? Um, who's in charge? Which nations are in charge? Those kinds of things all, all matter. Um, and again, trying to uh, focus on the, the key point of the, the prophecy as well. So. Um, the type of writing, of course, this matters all throughout Scripture. There's different types of writing. There's wisdom literature and poetry and um, prophecy, apocalyptic 
uh, narrative, uh, there's epistles, there's all kinds of different writings, and we have to read them as such. Um, you're not going to read a, uh, a book of Psalms like you're going to read uh, historical writings. They're, they're just different. There's figures of speech, and uh, the language is just different. So uh, another thing, we can use scripture. Uh, the Bible often uh, interprets or informs itself, so we can use different scriptures and cross-references to help us gain a better understanding of a prophecy. There's other prophetic books um, and words that uh, will help us uh, find find the, the true meaning. <clears throat> um, the timing and the fulfillment. Um, some prophecies represent uh, immediate fulfillment. Some are future. Some are both. Some are cyclical. Some uh, repeat. And some, um, when they repeat, they become uh, greater manifestations in the future. They build up. Um, so sometimes you might see this when we talk about uh, trying to identify the Antichrist. I don't want to open too much of this can of worms just yet, but um, a lot of people wondered uh, uh, from the book of Daniel, are they talking about Antiochus, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth? Were they talking about Titus and the, and the fall of Rome in 70, I'm sorry, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Uh, or are they talking about the Antichrist? And it could be all of the above. It could be uh, a smaller manifestation of a greater uh, fulfillment of that prophecy that's going to happen later. Um, kind of closing out this, uh, these thoughts here, there's, there's many other things we could mention, but um, ultimately we've we got to be hu- a little bit humble and open-minded when we're trying to interpret, interpret Bible prophecy. Um, maybe we're wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've heard the same thing so many times that I started to uh, really believe it and rejected all other ideas. So sometimes it's good to to hear the differing perspectives. Uh, again, sometimes they can scramble your brain as well and make it even more difficult. But um, it's good to be open to the other uh, interpretations as well, uh, just to see if they make sense and if they're in alignment. Um, there's plenty of uh, people who have thrown their hat in the ring when it comes to Bible prophecy. Uh, there's definitely no shortage of that. People have written entire books on it. People have gotten rich off it. There's televangelists, and, uh, and they focus on end times every, every week. And, uh, so there's no shortage of material and things you can look at as you try to interpret. But, um, but again, uh, end of the day, we need guidance from the Holy Spirit. We need to be in prayer. We need to uh, ask the Lord to help, um, help us see the true interpretation, if there is one, or at least the best interpretation. So um, <clears throat> thinking back on Bible prophecy, uh, especially for myself, it's something I've been fascinated in for a long time. And I can uh, think back when I was a teenager, my late teenage years, uh, there was one day something compelled me as I was thinking about the uh, end time, something compelled me to um, voluntarily open up a Bible for probably the first time I'd ever done it uh, outside of um, maybe children's or was a uh, youth, youth group or children's church or Sunday school. It's probably the first time that I voluntarily picked up a Bible to read it, <laughs> which is pretty sad when you think about it. It took me to my late teenage years. And at that point, I was so lost, uh, but, but I was fascinated by this idea uh, of this book that I'd heard about, it, this book of Revelation, where you could figure out or you could learn about what happens in the end, how it's going to play out. Um, are you going to be there for it, maybe? All those things, you know, who wouldn't want to know these things? Uh, you remember, uh, and especially in the 80s, there was Back to the Future, that movie where uh, in time travel and all these things, that people are so fascinated by the idea of learning what happens in the future and how can we adapt uh, in knowing what's going to happen. So that's... A pretty fascinating thing, and it um, compelled me to open up the book of Revelation. And uh, as far as I can remember, I read it from, from beginning to end. And uh, needless to say, I was very confused. I didn't have any of those guidelines, nor had I really read any other books of the Bible outside of you know, the common uh, passages that you read as you're, you're growing up, I suppose. Um, but I remember reading about these strange creatures coming out of the, the, the sea and the earth, uh, with horns and, and, it, and it, you know, you think about as a kid, you, you haven't seen anything like this before. You can't even imagine it. You might be thinking about like Godzilla coming up out of the, the water, you know. That's the only thing I could, like a kaiju, that's the only thing I could really uh, compare it to. But it terrified me. It terrified me to think about these massive creatures coming up and uh, just basically taking over the earth. Uh, of course, uh, at that point, I, you know, it, Revelation will tell you itself that these are symbols of uh, kingdoms and, and kings that will come along. But for me, uh, I didn't fully grasp all of that, so I was pretty terrified by the, the book of Revelation um, and confused, needless to say. But as I reflect on it, uh, I think perhaps the most 
important understanding that I gained from reading it, for as much as I missed and didn't understand, was the overall uh, theme or lesson of the book. And that is that Christ is going to return and, and he is going to be victorious over all of his enemies. And those who have trusted in him are going to dwell with him in eternity. And I think that was kind of the key thing that I took away, if I took away anything. And that's a, that's a great thing. It was the big picture message. All the other stuff, a lot of the other stuff, I didn't understand. I took little bits here and there. But I, I was able to kind of see uh, some of the big picture message, which was a blessing considering how uh, naive and lost I was at that point. Um, unfortunately, even uh, having grasped some of the big picture, understanding the book of Revelation, uh, I went on to, to live a life of sin for many years in my teenage and, and young adult years. And, uh, and, I th and I, of course, I believe a lot of that. I just didn't understand the, the gospel, the truth of the gospel. I didn't understand what a Christ had done for me. Um, Many of us have a tendency to kind of create a, a false god or idol in our minds that approves of all the things we want to do in our lifestyle, but it's not the biblical God uh, that, that we come to know and believe in as Christians. Um, it's kind of one that we create for ourselves. It's an imaginary God, if you will. That was, I believed in God, but that was the God I believed in. It wasn't the God of, of, of Scripture, and uh, I didn't understand the, uh, <clears throat> how profound it was what Christ did for me on the cross, uh, dying on the cross for me, and in his resurrection. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't grasp any of that. I didn't grasp, but I was a sinner in need of his grace, and there was no way I was going to be good enough to stand before him and judge him myself. I didn't understand that there were, uh, there's really, <laughs> you know, some people may, may not like this, but there's really, uh, objectively, there's no good people in this world by God's standard of morality. There's no good people. I'm, I, as much as I love you guys, and by worldly standards, I'm sure you are all fine people by... But by God's moral standard of perfection, moral perfection, there is no good people uh, in this world apart from him. He is the goodness that we have and by his Holy Spirit. That is where any goodness that we have comes from. Um, <clears throat> of course, I didn't understand that. A lot of us think, like, hey, I'm not as bad as that guy or that guy, so you know, the Lord will certainly uh, accept me into heaven. Um, I didn't understand that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. So many people come to believe that there's many different paths to God. Well, guess what? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He's the only way, and uh, I didn't understand that either. There's so many things I didn't understand. Uh, Paul said in Romans 3, 23 through 24, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. So I digress. Let's uh, get back to where we were here. So you may wonder why. I'm talking about the book of Revelation when we're looking at the book of Daniel today, and that's probably a pretty valid question to ask. But like the book of Revelation, um, which in many ways it expands on the prophecies in the book of Daniel, uh, which are uh, Daniel 7 through 12 are all um, prophecies that are given to Daniel. But uh, the book of Daniel, especially the prophetic um, half of the book. It presents us with some, some fascinating imagery and symbolism. It gives us a, a glimpse into the future and some of the huge global events that are going to occur. Some have occurred, some still have not. <clears throat> so as we well know, uh, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy and the promise of future fulfillment is a big part of how the Lord demonstrates his sovereignty and his omniscience uh, to those who know and who trust him. He tells us what he's going to do, and then he does it. And then, uh, of course, as believers, that gives us great confidence. We've seen this all throughout Scripture, the things that he has prophesied about and already fulfilled. Therefore, when we look into the future, we can trust that the things that are not fulfilled yet, he's going to fulfill. Um, sometimes hindsight is twenty twenty when it comes to Bible prophecy, you know. Um, and I think it, it's... Um, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty when it comes to fulfilled Bible prophecy, uh, sometimes, not always, but often we can look back and say, ah, I can see, now we can see how this played out. And, um, uh, but before things happen, it's a little more difficult. And I think that's a big part of why uh, we see so many Christians and teachers and scholars and people, they are, in general, they just obsess over the end times, uh, over end times prophecy. People are obsessed with it, myself included. Uh, Christians are expected to be able to see the signs of the end times, and most of us take that responsibility very seriously. We all want to be uh, ready. We know the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. We want to be as watchful and prepared as possible, uh, as possible. We want our lamps to be filled with oil as well. That oil being genuine holiness and faith and obedience and goodness and uh, good and righteous works that flow out 
from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. Uh, but unfortunately, one, as I mentioned before, one of the main downsides of um, these prophecies is that there's so many differing interpretations that can really just scramble your brain and get where I don't know what the truth is. I've heard 15 different interpretations and I don't know what to believe anymore. And I've definitely got myself to that place before several times. Uh, people are genuinely trying their best, but I think sometimes they're trying to fit things in uh, past and present and future events. They're trying to fit them in where they don't necessarily belong. And I think that's a huge part of what makes it so confusing for us. So I don't say it as a cop-out, but um, at the end of the day, we know that we are closer to the Lord's return with each passing day. And we know that we are closer to the Lord. Um, we know that we're getting warmer and warmer uh, to that day. So as believers, we, are, we know that we're to remain watchful as we try to filter out these uh, poor interpretations, these false interpretations in favor of the more genuine and maybe patient uh, and truthful ones. Some of the patient ones, I believe, that we're not looking maybe right now. We're looking further into the future than where we're at. And I think that's maybe even a brave thing to do these days because everybody wants to know now. What's this mean right now for us? Um, so as I previously alluded to by sharing my own experience about reading the book of Revelation as a teenager, sometimes when it comes to Bible prophecy, we may not understand hardly any of it, uh, let alone all of it. But we can still take uh, the things that we can and do understand, and we can store them in our hearts and minds until we understand more or we understand better, uh, just as Daniel did when he, uh, before he was given further knowledge and revelation beyond the visions and dreams that he had in chapter 7. So today I encourage you, don't be overwhelmed, don't be frightened, don't feel foolish if you can't get it all or don't grasp it all or if it's uh, intimidating, just take what the Lord gives you and hang on to that. And if you're so inclined, you can obviously study and work more on what you don't understand later on after today. So uh, looking at Daniel 7 here, it's the first of four significant uh, dreams and or visions that Daniel has between chapters 7 and 12. Uh, Daniel's <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9, they present us with different revelations that are given to Daniel at different times in his life. Uh, with the final three chapters, 10 through 12, they, of course, um, there are no chapters <laughs> in the Bible. We have chapters, but they were separated by three chapters. And this is one continuous revelation uh, in the book of Daniel from chapter 10 to 12. <clears throat> so for a couple of these revelations, including our chapter today in Daniel 7, we actually have to backtrack in Daniel's life to the beginning of the reign of King Belshazzar. Um, so uh, let's read the passage of verse 1 here. It says, the first year of, of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind. And as he was lying in bed, uh, visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed, and he wrote down the substance of his dream. Now, uh, there's an interpretation of all of this starting at verse 15. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through the first part, and we can focus more on the interpretation a little later. But we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, so Daniel had his dream. Visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. So. This was the first year of King Belshazzar, and of course, uh, when we looked at Daniel 5 in the writing of the wall, we know that Belshazzar uh, was killed that night. He saw the writing of the wall, which he didn't understand until Daniel came in and interpreted it. Um, King Belshazzar, uh, we, the first year was believed to be 553 BC, uh, and this is when he came into a co-regency with his father, King um, Nabonidus, who ruled from 556 to 539 BC. And of course, we know that's when uh, the Medo-Persian Empire came in with uh, Darius the Mede, and they, and they took over. They caught him off guard. They caught him by surprise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you might recall King Nebuchadnezzar had his dreams and visions in the book of Daniel, early in the book of Daniel in chapters 2 and 4. Uh, with the help of the Lord, Daniel was able to successfully visualize and interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's troubling dreams. The first dream described a massive statue of different uh, metals or materials, with the head and shoulders of gold representing Babylon and the rest featuring different materials that represented um, different, <clears throat> excuse me, different kingdoms that would come to power after Babylon's reign uh, as a nation had ended. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the king's second dream, his second dream in chapter 4, um, it was it described a massive tree. Uh, this tree, of course, represented the king. Um, and the Lord commanded his angels to cut down the tree and only leave the stump behind. And this represented the Lord's judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar due to his arrogance, his prideful and oppressive ways. Uh, we know that after going insane and spending seven times living in the wilderness like an animal, 
eating grass like an ox. King Neb finally repented and acknowledged um, that it was the Lord, it was Yahweh. He reigned over all things, all kings, all nations, all creation. Uh, and the king, of course, in response, wrote a letter to all the nations testifying and glorifying uh, the God Most High, uh, God Most High, the Hebrew God, and he had essentially seen the light at that point. And I only mention those details because uh, some aspects of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams are also going to provide meaning for what we see in Daniel chapter 7. Um, now, in chapter 7, Daniel, of course, has his own dreams and visions. Uh, before, he was mostly dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar's. Now, he's got dreams and visions of his own. <clears throat> Um, and as the prophets were known to, known to have done, um, you know, most of us think about Revelation, when we think about end times, they would write down the details and the contents of these dreams and visions that the Lord had given them so that the Lord's people could also hear about these prophetic, prophetic visions and the messages that the Lord was trying to convey to them. Uh, they were revealed for the sake of knowledge and understanding and wisdom, for the benefit, the assurance, the encouragement of, cur of current and future generations, including our current generation today. And, of course, we know they're also uh, meant for the sake of calling to repentance and, and punishment and warnings and those kinds of things as well. Um, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. And uh, the four winds are mentioned all throughout Scripture as well. And these four winds are uh, managed by four angels. And these are um, God's agents uh, who carry out his will and his plans on the earth. <clears throat> They can either gather people, they can separate people, they can bring um, uh, judgment and punishment, though they have a lot of, of, of power, whatever the Lord um, asks them to do. You might recall uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 31, he said, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven uh, to the other. They can also scatter and divide. <clears throat> They can hold back judgment. Uh, we see this in Revelation uh, chapter 7 as well. So um, the four great, I'm sorry, uh, let's look at verse 3 here. The four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Um, and there's four unique beasts. And um, in biblical and ancient Near Eastern literature, beasts often represent a powerful and oppressive earthly kingdoms and rulers. Um, and Daniel goes on to describe these four great and unique beasts. Uh, but they will not physically and literally manifest themselves as uh, beasts. Like I said, they're not going to come out of the water like Godzilla or Kaiju. These are symbols of different kings and kingdoms that are, that are going to come. <clears throat> uh, there's also different attributes for each of these beasts to, that are used to describe them. What kind of animal is it? Uh, do they have uh, heads and, and teeth and horns and wings? Uh, so, uh, but these things are also symbols of things about these kings or kingdoms, their strength, their capability, their longevity, their sphere of influence, uh, or maybe even just how brutal they are. Uh, and they came up out of the sea. The sea represents various nations and languages and peoples upon the earth um, or of the world. Uh, the condition of the sea, it was churned up. It can also represent or reflect the, uh, the geopolitical climate of the world at varying or specific times. And at this, at this time, it was tumultuous, it's chaotic, it's violent. Um, and determine these, these beasts that come out of the sea. He mentions them in chronological order as well. And some might debate that they all come out simultaneously, but I think um, when we look at other uh, passages, I think it's fair to say that they come out in, in, in that order. Um, yeah, I got some nice artwork on here. I found a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of neat artwork or line. We don't know if the beasts actually look like that, but maybe may close in his vision. Uh, so for, verse 4, the first... Beast was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle, and I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to think about uh, Daniel chapter 2 and this great statue that King Nebuchadnezzar saw, does this remind you of anything? Who might this king or kingdom represent? Had a lion-like appearance, um, which suggests strength and majesty and ferocity, traits uh, commonly associated with lions. <clears throat> uh, as a kingdom, it would represent a powerful and dominant kingdom. It had eagle's wings, uh, a lion with wings. Imagine that. <laughs> lions are scary enough as is. Imagine attaching eagle's wings to them. Um, eagles can convey speed and swiftness and the ability to rise above all others. So um, at some point, this lion, uh, the wings are removed and essentially uh, this is a humbling. This lion is humbled. His capability 
uh, some of his capability and, and his uh, pride, perhaps, is taken away, and he is uh, made to stand upright like a man. The mind of a human was given to it. Uh, we'll get more into that a little later. Verse 5, And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. And, of course, this bear-like appearance, this second beast, um, the imagery suggests strength and ferocity and uh, <clears throat> somewhat lumbering but a, a powerful nature. Beasts are often associated with brute force and uh, threatening presence. Uh, this one, of course, is large and imposing but not quite as agile and graceful. Think of a bear and think of a lion. You know, they're two uh, very similar in some ways but very different in others. Uh, Verse 6, after that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its, on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. Uh, of course, when you think about a leopard, leopard, you might think about swiftness, agility, and cunning. Um, known for, for speed, leopards are known for being extremely fast, for striking quickly. Um, this one, of course, had, has four wings on its back. Um, and we know that the, uh, wings, the birds are usually quick. It can cover a lot of territory in a quick amount of time. <clears throat> it also had four heads, which can symbolize um, multiple uh, facets of leadership and governance uh, and perhaps the authority to uh, reign over more territory. And these are all things that are uh, consistent with the kingdom that we're going to attribute it to. And verse 7, after that in my vision at night, I looked. And there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the other beasts. It had ten horns. So uh, my picture there, I'm not sure if that's what it looked like, but that's a pretty ugly, scary-looking beast, is it not? <laughs> it may have even been red in the vision, um, if you look into Revelation. But <clears throat> it was terrifying. It was dreadful. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't even described as an animal. They couldn't, they, they couldn't find an animal close enough, apparently, to, de to describe this beast, or uh, Daniel couldn't. Um, it was strong, it was unique, exceedingly powerful, and it also had ten horns on it. Um, and the horns uh, represent <clears throat> uh, uh, power or, or future kings. It was different from all the other beasts. It devours and tramples. Indicates an, an aggressive and dominant uh, presence or nature. It's uh, ruthless, it's self-consumed, it's determined. Seemingly unstoppable, you might even say. In verse 8, while I was talking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which, which came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And this horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Uh, so this new little horn comes up and uh, displaces three of the other horns. <clears throat> Think about this from a kingdom uh, perspective uh, or a ruler or a king had eyes that spoke boastfully. And this is a, a very strange vision, is it not? Just, just imagine these things in your mind. Like, how can you not imagine them as you're reading in your mind what these things might have looked like in Daniel's vision? This is a very strange and, and different thing. It's like a science fiction movie. Uh, look at that. <laughs> is that what he saw? Is it something like that? <clears throat> Verse 9, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, come out, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand uh, times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. And I don't know about you, but when I read this part of the vision here, as he looked uh, at this other vision, here comes another one that shows up. And this is a, a kind of qu quite a contrast between these beasts that Daniel had seen, and now he sees the true, the kingdom of God in heaven on this, uh, in this uh, new part of his vision here. He sees uh, the realm of heaven where the Ancient of Days takes his seat. He sees this, uh, this little horn here yapping away, and then he sees the true Ancient of Days uh, sitting on his throne. <clears throat> There's thousands upon thousands, and uh, just as there are uh, thousands and, and countless people on the earth who worship uh, the Lord, there's also in heaven, there's the heavenly host and, and all the angels that the Lord um, uh, has to carry out his will on the earth and in heaven. 
the court was seated and the books were open and things were uh, happening, things were being fulfilled in accordance with the Lord's sovereign plan and his will. And it also appears that the time for judgment upon the world uh, was either already occurring or was about to occur in the very near future in this vision. In verse 11, he says, Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had, had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. So John, of course, <laughs> John, that's funny, um, Daniel. I guess I was really thinking a lot about Revelation here. Daniel was very troubled and astounded by this little horn <clears throat> and its boastful words. Um, he wondered what his fate might be and how long the Lord would tolerate it before finally unleashing his wrath upon it. And sure enough, this little horn uh, was slain, its body destroyed, and was cast into the blazing fire of Revelation. You think of the lake of fire, and that's it. It's game over for this beast and the little horn. So uh, the other beasts, of course, have already been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to remain for, existing, uh, for a period of time. So what does Daniel see next? There's more. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. Um, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And this here is the, the official transfer of uh, power from the world going over uh, to the, the Son of Man who had come in this new kingdom that would come about that would never be destroyed, that would never end in contrast to the kingdoms of man. Um, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Who do you think he's talking about there? <laughs> who is he talking about there? Yeah, I, I believe probably everyone knows, and, and Christ often referred to himself as the Son of Man throughout the Gospels. Um, Got several examples here. I'm trying to figure out which one I'll, I'll share. Um, well, Jesus said in Matthew 26, 64, he said, um, I say to all of you, and this is when he was uh, held on trial before the, San, the Sanhedrin, he said, I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And they knew exactly what he was saying when he made that statement. And they, and they, and they tore their clothes, and they, were, uh, they just couldn't believe. They said, he's a blasphemer. Put him to death. What are we waiting for? And Christ told him exactly who he was. He was the son of, he is the son of man from the book uh, of Daniel. So, of course, they were outraged by this. There's many different messianic passages, and, of course, we don't, we're not going to make time for, for going through that. Um, a homework project for you if you'd like to, to do that. But <clears throat> He's coming in the clouds of heaven. Um, the cloud signifies divine authority and power. Um, clouds are often associated as God's presence and his glory um, in the heavens. And he approached the Ancient of Days, and as Christy uh, sang about, she was talking about the Ancient of Days, one of the many titles uh, for God, for Yahweh, God the Father. Um, and it further emphasizes the uh, divinity of Christ and his Son who came into his presence, who, uh, who was given uh, his authority to reign for forever. Um, yeah, I've got it. Got a lot here, but I know we're down to it. <laughs> <clears throat> of course, we know Christ will be worshipped by all nations, and there's so many things in the book of Revelation that, so many scriptures that we could quote here, um, but I'm, I'm going to continue on for the sake of time here. So, But his dominion is going to be everlasting, um, an everlasting dominion. Um, Revelation 11.15 says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And, uh, and again, there's so much more that can be said about this, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. In verse 15, it says, I, he says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. And I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. <clears throat> so Daniel, at this point, had seen some incredible uh, <laughs> and terrifying things in this vision. Uh, but what does it all mean, was this question now. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for our people? Is it going to happen in my lifetime? There will be so many questions that you would start to ask if you had seen something like this, I imagine. So he asked one of those who were present in his vision. Um, and the one who was present told him, 
He says, so he, he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But, the only people, but only the people of the Most High, uh, the holy people of the Most High, will receive the kingdom and will possess it, yes, forever and ever. So uh, here we're told the four great beasts are going to have authority and power upon the, upon the earth for a time. Uh, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. And you know what? That's some great news at this point in the story because... You know, you hear about these beasts and, of course, the fourth terrifying beast and this uh, yappy little horn that comes out. <clears throat> and it's good to have some good news here to know um, that there, there's a, a, some, some bright points coming ahead in the future. Uh, that's not going to be the end-all, be-all. And we praise the Lord for that, and we all like a happy ending to a story, do we not? I know I do. I get pretty frustrated when a movie ends, ends poorly and, the, uh, and things don't work out for the main characters. <laughs> some people like a, a nasty ending. I don't. <clears throat> Daniel still had some questions, though. In verse 19, he says, Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. So Daniel wasn't satisfied. He still had some more questions here. He didn't have the closure he wanted. He wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, um, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. He said, I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them, until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Um, so, of course, at this point, Daniel still got some very valid questions and concerns, and I imagine most of us would want to know some of these details, too. Um, if we were Daniel. <clears throat> Who was this unique and vicious and awful fourth beast that wasn't even described as a commonly known animal? Who was it? And what about these ten horns uh, that come out from the beast? And, but what about the other little horn that came up and displaced three of them? What is the identity of these, these, these uh, rulers or nations that they represent? So in the response and the interpretation... Um, Daniel's not told about the first three beasts because I don't think he really cares that much about them as much as he cares about the fourth beast and what's going on with that. Um, but if we look back in the book of Daniel, I think we can connect some dots about this, uh, the first three beasts and the fourth uh, beast as well in, in his attributes. So looking at Daniel 2, we're going to um, try to interpret who these first three beasts. So Daniel 2, uh, looking back at that vision, Daniel said, uh, talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, Awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and, and clay, and it smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So the first beast, with that being in mind, and we talked about some of this, uh, uh, we talked about Daniel chapter 2. Uh, the first beast was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. <clears throat> and I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. The Daniel 2 uh, correlation would be, uh, when Daniel says, Your Majesty, uh, he told him, who was this? Uh, who is the head of the statue? He says, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, wherever they lived, uh, wherever they live, and he has made you ruler over them all. He says, you are that head of gold. <clears throat> um, of course, we know the Babylonian Empire, they reigned from 605 to 539 B.C. Um, and traditionally, this first beast is attributed to the Babylonian Empire, um, of course, we know that also um, King Nebuchadnezzar was humbled, and he uh, ate grass like an ox. He lost his mind, essentially, for seven times. And we talk about um, the wings being torn off. Uh, we talk about this king being humbled, and, and he essentially uh, went from an unreasoning beast, as, as I believe Paul said at one point, to having the mind in the heart of a human being. And uh, he stood on his two feet like a human being. The mind of a human was given to it. And uh, to me, that, that represents King Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that's a pretty solid 
uh, correlation there for us. The second beast, they're performing as a second beast, which looked like a bear. Um, the Daniel 2 interpretation, after, uh, Daniel says, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. That's all he says about it. Not a whole lot of respect for uh, the second kingdom. But the second beast traditionally is associated with the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, and of course, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire was, was huge and had a, a huge sphere of influence. Uh, the three ribs would have um, symbolized the, the major territories that they reigned over, which was uh, Libya, Babylon, and Egypt, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, these are the identities of the first two beasts. The third beast, um, <clears throat> this one looked like a leopard on its back. It had four wings, uh, like those of a bird, and it had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. Um, <clears throat> the third beast is traditionally associated with the Grecian Empire, particularly under the rule of Alexander the Great. You might re recall uh, from history, I believe in, in probably about 10 years, he essentially conquered the whole world. And he certainly couldn't have done it all by himself. He had a great army, and he also had great generals that helped him out, and they were able to swiftly uh, conquer territory uh, together. Of course, Alexander the Great, I, think, I believe he died in his early 30s, and these four generals, um, they divided his kingdom amongst these four generals, which would represent the four heads, the four wings. They moved quickly. Um, to reign over vast territory. <clears throat> uh, verse, 20, uh, verse 23, he gave me this uh, explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth, and it will different, be different from the other four kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns of the ten kings who will come from this kingdom, um, the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, and after them another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings, so we know... At this point, uh, this is a king that's going to arise and subdue three other kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hand for a time, times, and half a times. So the fourth beast, um, looking at Daniel's interpretation, he said, Finally, there's going to be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, uh, for, iron uh, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Uh, so the fourth beast is commonly associated with being the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and of course, out of the Roman Empire and this beast, uh, several other uh, kingdoms emerge in the future. Including this little horn, uh, which we're, we're talking about. So the ten horns, um, again, horns uh, often represent power and strength and authority. Um, of course, we know now that the four beasts represent four kingdoms or empires, and the horns are understand to symbolize the rulers and kings that would arise out of these empires. <clears throat> Going back to the Daniel 2 interpretation again, he said, Just as you saw, the feet and toes were partly baked clay and partly, uh, partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. And as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain unified any more than iron mixes with clay. So this divided kingdom, how many toes you got in your feet? Has anybody got less than 10 in here? <laughs> think about 10 toes, 10 horns. And I think that's a, a fair correlation to make as well between Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7. This is that divided kingdom that comes out from the Roman Empire or emerges after the Roman Empire, um, but the beast itself <clears throat> represents this, uh, this, this political, this military system, this oppressive system, and it will use uh, religion and uh, uh, manipulation, whatever it has to do to keep power, and it will certainly, Christians are faithful to the Lord to the end, and this, this type of world power will do whatever it takes to rid people that will not be loyal to it, and that's kind of what you see, especially in the book of Revelation when you talk about the Antichrist, and Christians are going to hold faithful um, to their faith in, in the Lord to the, to the bitter end, even if it causes them death. And that is precisely what the Antichrist is going to look to do when that time comes. Uh, speaking of which, the little horn that displaced the three and spoke boastfully, Daniel wanted to know about this as well. <clears throat> um, this was a, the other king that arise that was different than the earlier ones. He would subdue three kings. He would oppress the holy people, change the set times and laws, and the holy people will be delivered into his hands for time, times, and half a time. So um, Paul, <clears throat> there's many different places we could look here, but Paul, uh, just one prime example. In 2 Thessalonians 
uh, chapter 2, 3 through 4. He said, don't let anyone deceive you. <sighs> Sorry. <coughs> no, I got something. <clears throat> That's just frustrating. Sorry. I'm sure it's frustrating for you too. He said, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. He's talking about the return of the Lord. Um, he said, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And that is why this, uh, that is why this horn is different from all the others. He is, uh, he's extremely bold. And uh, again, he displaces three of the other kings, uh, essentially overtaking them or, or inheriting their territory. Um, he's arrogant. He's blasphemous, uh, blasphemes the name of the Lord and his people. Um, he wars against the saints. He, he uh, persecutes God's people. He even seeks to change the times and the law. And guess what? Only the Lord has the right to do such thing. He, he who wants to exalt himself to the fullest extent. Time, times, and half a time. Um, 42 months, three and a half years, roughly 1,260 days. There's different arguments about the different uses of these numbers, but um, generally kind of a, a same, a similar time frame. Um, often mentioned in the book of Revelation is this period of time that we know as the Great Tribulation. The Tribulation has been going on um, all along in the church age, but the Great Tribulation, the, end, the very end when this man of lawlessness emerges, that's going to be the Great Tribulation. Of course, we know that the God is going to pour out his wrath. Um, and, and at that point, we're not going to be here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <clears throat> There's parallels in the book of Revelation, of course, uh, talking about the beast. Uh, in Revelation 12, it talks about the dragon with seven heads and ten horns. What does that, does that remind you of something? Uh, the beast assumes its power uh, that comes from the serpent, that comes from, from the, the dragon, the devil from Satan. That's who he gets his power from. And when they worship the beast, they also worship Satan simultaneously. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go into all the Revelation here. I'd, I'd like to, but I know we're... we're uh, Really getting past it here. So, um, there's also a beast mentioned in Revelation uh, several times in Revelation 13. <clears throat> um, uh, wait a minute here. Um, beast. This beast is talked about as having seven heads, ten horns as well. So, who does it remind you of? It's this fourth beast, but also. You think about the ten toes, the, the divided kingdom. Um, that's who these ten horns will represent. Of course, we know that the last one, this little horn, um, is going to be who we know as the Antichrist at the end. <clears throat> and we need to know how to recognize him when he comes on the scene. Verse 26, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. <clears throat> You might recall, he had said in verse 11, Then I continued to watch, because of the boastful words that the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed, thrown into the blazing fire, uh, the lake of fire, the other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. So um, that's the day of the Lord, when this, this beast is overcome, and, and all of the uh, nations and the people that uh, give their loyalty to the beast. Uh, I knew Mom the other night got us on a little bit of a... a a rabbit trail talking about the uh, uh, the mark of the beast. We're not going to talk about that this morning. Uh, I will like to talk about that at some point. But um, there's people that are going to be identified with one side or the other. You're either going to be have the mark of the Lord on your hand and your forehead, or you're going to have the mark of the beast. So that is something, that is a choice we're all going to have to make. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But you can definitely see how things are building up to this point. <clears throat> so this is the day of the Lord. Um, when Christ returns and assumes victory in his eternal kingdom, uh, comes in and displaces all the, the kingdoms of man and the kings, kingdoms of the world. Um, in Daniel 2, interpretation, uh, verse 44, he says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor it will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Uh, he says, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out from the mountain, not hewn by uh, human hands, a rock that broke, uh, that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. This is the rock. Uh, this, is, this is Christ uh, returning 
to destroy these kingdoms once and for all. Um, so essentially at that point, it's game over. And that's the slaying of the beast. That's the slaying of the, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all the, all, all the world that follow them into destruction and damnation. In verse 27, it says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will worship and obey him. So when it says we will, we will reign with Christ someday, that's what it's talking about. Christ will assume authority and sovereignty, and we who put our faith and trust in him, we're going to be there with him, reigning alongside him. Um, obviously not above him, but uh, beneath him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through uh, uh, 12 here, uh, Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. <clears throat> Conversely, he says, if we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. <clears throat> um, I talked about the, um, that scene in the heaven with the Ancient of Days and uh, being attended to by thousands and thousands and 10,000 10, times 10,000. The court was seated, the books were open, and this is a sign of judgment, impending judgment. And we know that the Lord um, at the end is going to, to judge uh, the world, the living and the dead. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm gonna... Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. I'm just going to read this, and we're, we're working towards the closing. I apologize. Um, it says... Uh, 63, 1 through 6, it says, Who is this coming from Edom, from uh, Bozrah, with his garment stained crimson? Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, announcing glory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger, and I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments and stained all of my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me, and I trampled down the nations in my anger. And in my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. So at the end, the Lord cannot contain his wrath any longer. And that is this, this point of the end, where the, na the, the nations... Uh, and the, and the kings and rulers of the world are finally cut off. Uh, verse 28 says, This is the end of the matter, and I, Daniel, was deeply troubled at my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So at this point, Daniel is back to reality. Uh, this heavy vision and this interpretation that Daniel had received had finally concluded. It all spoke of the importance and the gravity of the revelations that he had received about these end times, uh, these future kingdoms, divine judgment, uh, and the rise and the fall of these kingdoms. And Daniel, of course, recognized the significance of what has been shown to him. Um, his face was pale. He was deeply troubled. He felt uh, some anxiety and distress about the visions that he encountered. <clears throat> these themes of judgment and suffering and the struggle between good and evil were weighing heavily upon him. Um, his emotional reaction here conveys that the prophetic mes messages uh, that we read are not to be taken lightly, um, and if they come for the Lord, they're sure to happen. Daniel's choice to keep the matter to himself highlights the burden that often comes with prophetic insight. Uh, prophets are often forced to um, uh, face with revelations that are difficult and troubling and carry significant implications for their communities. It can lead to a sense of isolation or responsibility knowing that the messages they receive might be difficult for others to understand and accept. And this certainly uh, probably would have been one and may even be one for you today. <clears throat> we can sense the underlying weight of this prophetic message concerning God's ultimate victory over evil, the establishment of his kingdom, the call for faithfulness um, amid adversity. Daniel's troubled feelings remind us that even God's most, most faithful, <laughs> faithful servants um, also experience confusion and fear and anxiety when faced with the profound realities of worldwide spiritual warfare um, in the unseen realm that manifests itself in the world below uh, and below God's divine sovereignty. Things can be tough and things can get scary. Sometimes when things get tough, 
We just need someone to encourage us that it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, the Lord has told us, essentially, that it's going to be okay in so many ways, including this prophecy here. Um, uncertainty and not knowing how things will turn out or if things will get better, it's a scary thing. But when you know the ending, it's not so scary anymore. It's like watching, uh, <laughs> I remember Pastor Paul uh, mentioned this illustration before, but it's kind of like watching a DVR game when you already know that your team has won the game. It's like watching it after the fact. Um, you know, during the game, you might be watching this game, and it's back and forth, looking doubtful. You're not exactly sure how things are going to play out. You only know the score as you start to watch the game. Um, you don't know how things are going to play out, but deep down, you already know that there's really, no matter what happens, there's really no need for concern um, because you've already seen the final score. You know how things are going to end. If you chose to voluntarily suppress that knowledge and to take this scary ride or emotional roller coaster as you watch this game, who else can you really blame but yourself for that? <laughs> was the final score not enough evidence for you? Uh, when your team was still down by quite a bit in the fourth quarter, did you start to question your eyes and, and your sanity and feel as if maybe you had been duped somehow when you saw that score? Or will you know that you know what you know and be able to enjoy the ride and watching this game without fear and without doubt. I think that's kind of the positions we were in. Um, the Lord himself, he wrote this book, and uh, all of time is laid out before him. For he's the beginning, he's the end, he's the alpha, he's the omega. He knows the ending, and he's also shared that ending with us. Uh, for him, the story is already like a, like a story or a book or a movie recorded on the DVR. And guess what? The Lord wins. He knows it, and we know it too. Or do we? Will we allow ourselves to forget? Will we let the trials and tribulations and the testings that we face in this world cause us to doubt, to fear, or maybe even forget? <clears throat> know that you're on his team. Know that you're on the winning team. And you need to know today that he rejoices in the fact that you are on his team that you have put your trust in him, that you love him, that you believe in him. You can even reign with him in his everlasting kingdom, and you will enjoy the spoils of victory along with him. <clears throat> Does a mother dwell on the pains of labor after she has given birth? Not that I know by experience, but... <laughs> Does she dwell on the pains of labor after she has given birth? It may be difficult, um, might be a difficult road getting there, but the hardships will seem, just seem like a bad dream once you've reached the finish line and you have the victor's crown placed upon your head. The Lord will know who is and was faithful to the end and whose names will be found in the book of life. And if you're a believer today, if you're born again, having repented and believed in Christ as Lord and Savior and having received the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to strive to finish, finish strong uh, to complete your race of faith so that you will receive that victor's crown. As a church, let us walk with the Lord together, unified by our faith in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, who strengthens and encourage, uh, strengthening and encouraging each other. Always remembering the, the eternal gospel that he has given to us. And that is uh, for our salvation and for the sake of true eternal life. He's going to come back and restore all creation to the way it should have been at the beginning. We're not there yet, but we know it's going to be there. And I don't know about you, but I want to be there on that day when it happens. <clears throat> For one day the Son of Man is coming and coming with the clouds of heaven. And he's been a, given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language will worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Then the sovereignty and power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High in his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So my final question this morning, do you know today that it's going to be okay? 